Hi, I'm Luke Imhoff. Uh, as you may remember from the lightning talk yesterday, uh, I'm known everywhere as Chronic Death. I'm the maintainer of the IntelliJ Elixir plugin, uh, and I also run the Austin Elixir meetup here in town. Uh, but my talk today is about my work at Communication Service for the Deaf. In September 2015, CSD started a new Phoenix 1.0.2 project. It contained a single OTP application, interpreter server with lib, test, and web directories. Between then and ElixirConf 2016 in Orlando, about a year later, I joined CSD, and the rest of the team and I slowly built up that Phoenix project, adding support for talking to other services, partner server, and Lighthouse server using RabbitMQ and talking to an Ember front end using JSON API. Lighthouse is, an, is for authentication. It stores our users and issues JWT uh, web tokens that all the other front ends can use to talk to other services. Partner server, on the other hand, is targeted at our partners or the interpreting agencies themselves. It's where they can set up jobs for interpreters to accept and to file the client requests and business requests for those jobs. Interpreter server is targeted to the actual ASL interpreters, where they can accept jobs and set up their certifications, because that's a big issue for us, is that we have certified ASL interpreters and not just anyone off the street that thinks they can sign. Together, this is Vinya. At ElixirConf 2016, Chris McCord gave his keynote on Phoenix 1.3. Now, remember, this is based on what he said then, not what he's just told us. Where he mentioned the web directory would disappear, and that optionally, umbrella projects could be used to separate the web interface from repository access or other business logic. I was excited, but the templates for Phoenix 1.3 wasn't even a PR yet. I actually was looking at the GitHub repo as Chris was talking, looking to figure out how to do this. Um, so I was stumped. I had never used Umbrella Projects before. I had heard people talk about on podcasts that they always use Umbrella Projects, they always use OTP apps, but I didn't know what the secret sauce was. It just seemed to be like the way I should be doing it. <coughs> Thankfully, I was in luck. Uh, Wojtek Mach was giving a presentation on Umbrella Projects. I recommend watching it if you haven't seen it. It's a great talk. Uh, but his talk is from Umbrella from the beginning. Chris and Voitex Talks left me with the question of how do I get to that great umbrella project from where I started with a single monolithic application? From Voitex's presentation, I learned that umbrella projects still had a top level mix.exs, but all the code lives in this apps directory. Each directory under apps had a separate OTP application, which is just what the root of the directory of a normal project was. So it just is move the root down to apps and make more projects under apps. The first step was to put your project root under apps. This will involve a bunch of git moves to preserve history. You'll likely make some mistakes. I know I did. Phoenix 1.3 will use the web suffix for this OTP app, so we'll do the same here. You'll need to move, do the move first because your root's going to have a new mix.exs, and otherwise you'll get file name conflicts. After moving your mix.exs from the root of the project to the apps and my app web directory, some of the paths need to be written to point back. In umbrella products, the build path, config path, and depth path are all shared. It's one of the main things that separates OTP apps and umbrella from just using path-based dependencies. If you use mix new inside the apps directory, these path rewrites happen automatically, which wasn't but our mix.exs that you're going to do with git move isn't set up that way, so you have to do all these changes manually. The way I actually figured it out was just set up a fake umbrella app and copy the changes in. I recommend the same thing if you can't remember these changes from the presentation. The new root needs to be a mix project, but unlike a full OTP app, the mix.exs project function will only have four options. Three of the options, build embedded, depths, and start permanent are the same as any other project. But for the root umbrella project, we have a, a top level config apps path that defaults to apps. So just like a lot of stuff in Elixir, there is no magic. It is explicit. It, just the convention is to call it apps. Eventually, you may want to fill depths in to fill in things that need to be at the root. Uh, examples would be Credo, 
and um, dialyze or dialixir because if you don't put them in the root, they won't work from the root directory, only from individual apps directories. Although each OTP app has its own config directory with its own config files, the overall config for the project is unified. Top level config dire directory says go grab all the other configs. And then each individual config will point up here and say loop back. So from any directory, you always get the same set of config files. Since you're going to use Logger in all your OTP apps, you can eliminate divergent configurations, which was a problem we had, uh, by actually pointing this, your Logger config just in the top level area. I recommend turning on handle OTP reports and handle SAS reports so they all go through the same Logger and you don't lose SAS reports that only would be in the Erlang Logger otherwise. After all the moves, renames, and replacements, you're left with an umbrella project with a single OTP app in the apps directory. It's more complicated, not less, than what you started with, and you have to wonder what was the point. Well, umbrellas only start to pay off when you start to break up that single app. But the question is, where's the first crack to start shattering the web application? From Chris's keynote on Phoenix 1.3, I knew that dash dash umbrella option for Phoenix New was going to replace the Ecto module both the repo and the schema in an OTP app separate from Phoenix. Putting the Ecto repo and schema in their own OTP app isn't enough if you just treat it like a separate namespace. We want to be able to test and use the domain logic without the need for Phoenix controllers. So this is the bounded context that Chris was talking about. Why? Well, you may not think about it often, but any Phoenix project already has two UIs. The Phoenix API that we present to the web, but also the UI we use as developers, DevOps, or maintainers from IEX. So if you've ever had the problem of debugging or having to set up code and it's just a hassle to do it in IEX, that's because that UI is bad. After a lot of refactoring cycles, uh, like three or four, I eventually came up with a transport neutral behavior that can hide whether we're getting data from Ecto, Rabbit, or even local gen servers that back ports to use SSH uh, port forward tunnels that we use for debugging. Uh, and I called it uh, Kelsinator Resources. This is only my supposition of what a domain module could look like in Phoenix 1.3. It doesn't use the function prefixing system that uh, Chris showed. Uh, instead that I can have callbacks and uh, OTP behaviors to actually check at compilation time. The behavior supports controller, -like, controller action-like callbacks, but also support for testing with sandboxing. Certain callbacks, like change set, insert, and update, have two forms to allow the optimization when calling in the controller-like Kelsinator module. Query options encode, encode common options, such as pagination, sorting, and associations to include in the response. Uh, we built Kelsinator to target JSON API, but I wanted this to work for anyone that's not just using JSON API, so query options are more ectocentric, where they have params and associations instead of relationships that JSON API would use. You may find this list useful. Uh, you may like some of the things, some not. If you like it completely, you can just use the package on hex. Since I want Kelsinator to work with ecto, RabbitMQ, and really any backing data store. The returns are more complicated than, than Ecto, as I want to be able to handle more error conditions without having to know each data store's exceptions. So usually when you get an exception all the way down Postgres, it's a Postgres error. I didn't want to have to know that because I'm not supposed to know that Postgres is backing me. Owner, error ownership is good for any ownership errors, which can happen anytime you're inter interacting with RPC or when you're doing the Ecto ownership stuff for testing. And I want it to be an error, not exception, so that it can be surfaced as an API error during tests. So in con cases in Phoenix, it actually shows up as a bad return instead of them appearing in the logger output, which some developer has to notice the log got extra noisy during testing. Likewise, error timeout allows for gen server timeouts to be shown in an assert response failure instead of appearing in the SASL log. I found doing OK struct or error not found to be easier to match in a width than using OK struct or nil. So I recommend that for all git like calls. It turns out the either monad is really useful. So for a general platonic 
Phoenix project, that's as far as I can advise how to break up your project. A domain OTP app and the Phoenix web OTP app. But let me cover the specifics of CSD's own project to give you some more ideas for how to break up your project when converting to an umbrella project. And Serpenter Server, as I said before, is CSD's project for allowing sign language interpreters to find and track jobs for multiple agencies. On the front end, it uses Ember to talk to Phoenix controllers that respond with JSON API. On the back end, it uses Ecto to talk to a database it owns to represent the data owned by the interpreters. So their profile, their address, and their credentials. But it also has to talk over RabbitMQ to background processes running RPC servers that can access databases owned by two Ruby on Rails uh, server-owned databases. I don't know if this is the case for you, but a lot of places seem to have that mix. We got lucky. We got one app with Elixir. We didn't get them all. Um, for debugging purposes, we can access the backend using SSH tunnels helmed in memory that allow either IX or Observer remote connections. The Ember front end uses Ember CLI, so to keep the publishing consistent with the Ruby on Rails servers, the Ember front end is published from a Redis cache. So the cracks in Interpreter Server, our Phoenix OTP app, become, became obvious when I list it like this. Now, mind you, this is somewhat of a generalization. It took a while to figure out this list was the obvious way to break it up. Unfortunately, there's no way to go through the struggles and still make this a good talk. Each UI should get its own OTP app, but so should each backing store. So let's see how I actually did that. When shattering your web OTP app into more pieces, you may end up with these four separations because some code is needed in two OTP apps, but they no longer share a common dependency because you don't have the monolith. This was the case with us with, with interpreter server JSON API because they have shared views that are both used to talk over RabbitMQ for RPC and in the Phoenix web. Observer already has its own UI, but the steps necessary to connect it over S an SSH port to forward to a containerized host also needs to be a good user experience. So Interpreter Server Observer contains an interactive walkthrough that walks any developer through the commands to copy and paste through two terminals simultaneously. Pretty much you put in a value and then it spits out the next command to throw in the remote terminal and goes back and forth. It's uh, almost sort of like a text-based adventure. Uh, and with this, we're able to set up a remote console to our hosting or get Observer to connect to production or QA containers instead of one set up by the remote console. So this is very much like a Heroku setup where when you ask for a console, you actually get a new container. But since we have RabbitMQ, we can actually shut down the RPC servers on the, co the console container we just spun up, send a message, and say, hey, open an SSH tunnel, and production will respond and come back to my laptop, and I can run Observer then on container infrastructure that's not supposed to support SSH. Uh, this may work on Heroku, but we don't use, use, use Heroku. We use a provider that uses Heroku-ish, which is a Python implementation that kind of makes it work like Heroku. I haven't tried it myself. Um, Interpreter RPC talks to RabbitMQ, so it owns the connection to RabbitMQ because you're supposed to pool it and have one connection in multiple channels. The RP, and it also uh, supervises all the RPC servers that expose the database owned by Interpreter Server to the Ruby on Rails applications, and it also has apps so that we can have RPC clients to talk to the Ruby on Rails applications. With all this code being moved out of the normal Phoenix app, the Phoenix app Interpreter Server Web is down to just controllers and views that the Ember front end needs to consume. The controllers are minimal because the Calcinator package that I made makes it so that it's mostly declarative with use statements saying which actions we want to use to support JSON API. And there's a couple plugs to help with authentication and authorization, such as needed foreign keys. And Interpreter Server Web does have a few views that aren't in JSON API resources because there are parts of authorization that are mixed into the view layer uh, to hide role-based fields that don't apply in the inter-backend communication for RPC, which kind of sends all the data at once back and forth. During the shattering of Interpreter Server Web, authorization was one of the hardest aspects to disentangle into its own application. I was never able to make it completely its own layer because there's no good way with an Ecto schema struct to indicate that a field was censored without making up some random value for that field. 
And so we end up having some of the authorization for the entire structs to be its own layer, but some of it to also be stuck in Joss Serializer views, where we override the attribute callbacks to hide some fields. Our Ember app handles fetching, setting, and invalidating the Redis cache for Ember CLI. Interpreter is for data owned by interpreter server and accessed using an Ecto repo connected to Postgres. Lighthouse and Partner are two Rubies and, and Rails applications, but we actually mirror them in Elixir to represent their Ecto schemas that we need to deserialize the data over RabbitMQ when we get it from those services. But additionally, uh, to be sneaky, uh, during integration tests, uh, Scott actually had a thing to uh, have Ecto repos clear the database, because it's actually faster for us to clear Rails database for it than to ask Rake to do it. Uh, As you can see, there are multiple Postgres apps, Interpreter, Lighthouse, and Partner. This is because I would not recommend having the store format decide how to group your code into OTP apps. Instead, I'd share the OTP apps based on the owner of the data or its use case. So Partner is a partner agency focused, Interpreter is interpreter focused, and Lighthouse is auth focused. So if there were a new use case for Redis, I would make a separate OTP app from Ember. If some of the code in Ember turned out to be useful to both, I'd make a second OTP app that represents the library of the common shared bits of Redis. The three Postgres-backed OTP apps reflect the distinct databases that they're backed by. And in theory, we could start using that to scale or deploy only parts of our umbrella application as releases to new containers. SSH Tunnel is probably the most classic OTP app. It is a supervision tree of gen servers tracking PIDs to external OS processes. It also includes an interface for setting up SSH keys, so setting all the things in uh, your home directory .ssh, but in the hosting environment. If you're wondering why that's necessary when SSH is a li library in the Erlang Serum library, it's because the SSH library in the Erlang Serum library was accepted because someone wanted to send in a patch to give it, but it was in the days before they really tested all those contributions and made sure they were maintainable. So it's not really all the SSH protocol. It's definitely not the part that does tunneling. And until uh, a recent release of 19, it didn't even do auth mechanisms that most SSH servers would accept. So it was just easier uh, to actually use a physical SSH client binary that was inside the containers from our hosting to dial back to our machines to use observer and uh, remote, sh cells, uh, remote sessions. I need to emphasize this because it's important when searching for a validation or params casting library. Ecto is both a way to talk to your database using Ecto repo, but also, and far more generally useful, it is a way of validating params even when they don't come from the internet through Phoenix. And it can be used to track changes to those structs. At CSD, we use Ecto for converting to and from params in retort over RPC, over RabbitMQ, it represents the SSH tunnels in memory to track the SSH client processes, and for the more common usage of just accessing the Postgres database. When applying these considerations to your own project, understand that making a new OTP app in your umbrella project can just be an intermediary step on the way to making the code separate, distinct hex package. Not all code needs to or should become a hex package, though. A namespace doesn't need any more justification than you keep repeating the same prefix or suffix on all your functions. Or you need a new place to put a def struct since there's only one per module. Moving to a separate OTP app in an umbrella project, the contents of the app need to be testable and usable on their own. If you move to a, a namespace into its own OTP app, but you can't test or use it effectively from IEX without bolting another OTP app on top, then it's probably not worth being a separate OTP app. Just leave it a nested namespace. Going so from a separate OTP app to a separate repository has both pros and cons. The pro, from my personal experience, is that you can shed build time by compiling, testing, and dialyzing that separate repo when it actually changes. We have full, clean dialyze on all our Elixir code. It is great when it works. You change a type signature, and you can safely point at all the places you have to refactor. So since it's only tied to those changes, you don't 
need to compile tests and dialyze like you would all the OTP apps in an umbrella project. Unless you do some very clever things about figuring out the code hasn't changed and won't affect the downstream OTP apps. The con of this is that you have sometimes the standardized coordinated release update dance when it turns out that you have a breaking change in that repository that requires updating all the downstream repositories. But I had this issue in Ruby too. It's just something that happens with open source repos that you also use in your own internal apps. Jumping from a separate repository to a hex package first requires that the repository is publicly published. It also means increased duties as hopefully you're publishing to hex because you want the community to use your package. This involves a dedication to support the package in any community involved. Don't pollute hex.pm with your project that has a single commit that says initial commit. You want to build the community around the project. You want it to have updates. You want to make sure you're going to maintain the community around that project. It is perfectly OK for an OTP app to stop at any of these stages. Sometimes, like for interpreter server JSON API, which just contains views specific to our app, there's no reason to go beyond an OTP application to do that. Because anything more than that makes maintenance harder. Another repo makes maintenance harder. Having it published on Hex makes maintenance harder. Although I will say it is really nice that Hex has the revert feature because I've used that a lot. From interpreter server, CSD has open sourced three packages, Alembic, Calcinator, and Retort. The first package, Alembic, deals with JSON API format validation. As you can see from the platform diagram, JSON API appears in a lot of places, servers, controllers, clients. We spotted this so early in the design of interpreter server that Alembic actually jumped straight from a namespace to an independent hex package without going through the intermediary steps of being an OTP app and an umbrella project. I actually open sourced it before I even did the umbrellafication. So this type of component is easy to pick out. Find all the pieces where you interact with the same encoding format and make it a library. Sometimes to find the common code that can be extracted in another OTP application, you need to start ignoring the actual data, ignore the structs, and look at the transformation pipeline. Zooming in on RPC servers and controllers, you can see there were two types of RPC servers and two types of controllers. The obvious place to unify the servers and the controllers is that they both interact with Ecto. But that leaves the SSH part and the RPC client in the dark. In this view, we'll concentrate on listing the, the resources with the index action and methods. So I could kind of make this work, uh, but controllers depend on plug. Uh, while the RPC servers use their own struct and use normal pipelines, because I didn't want to do a plug builder just for my RPC servers, uh, only the controllers do authorization. Uh, some of the data is in Ecto repos, and that's got its own interface already. But there's also SSH tunnels talking to gen servers. And the clients are different because they need to spawn a client connection first. Finally, the output is different. This result output just goes back into a struct or a map, while the render function from Phoenix puts it in the con as rendered HTTP and HTML. So there are a couple techniques I combined here to extract out Calcinator. First, combine nomenclatures. JSON RPC may call it a method, but these methods need to support the same operations as a normal JSON API controller. So just settle on the controller nomenclature of action. Next is the issue that RPC servers don't do authorization, only controllers do. So borrow the null object pattern from OO and have a default authorization module that does no checks. Although I will say, ours actually does a check that you don't set a user, so if you start wanting authorization, you can't accidentally forget to check that the user is authorized. Third, the RPC client back controllers have an extra step of making that client and potentially handling that it can't get a client. But if we think about it, Ecto repo is it really hiding connection management from us. So you can group these two rows together under resources. 
for authorization of individual structs in the return list, we'll use the null authorization for RPC servers. Finally, and this took a while to realize, the result and render row couldn't be broken up because the convenience of Phoenix controller render is hiding the fact that that render is actually doing two things, it is both rendering the view and then encoding it directly into the plug response. To make this a transport neutral system, these two steps need to remain separate so that the common format of a JSON API map can be correctly injected into either an outer JSON RPC map and then encoded, or encoded directly by poison into the plug con response. These steps of calling the action, authorizing the action with can here, getting the, the resource, authorizing the resource, and then rendering the view, and then returning it back out to the encoding with this tuple, are precisely represented in Calcinator index. The only addition that I didn't mention was support for sandbox access. And this is thread both in our controllers and our RPC servers, because we actually have tests that throw the, the way that we get concurrent browser testing, and we actually throw it over the RPC, use a thread local variable in Ruby to send it back over for RPC requests back to the Elixir side. This action only contains the happy path because all the matching with, with will handle the OK and the error will hand through for the caller of this index action to actually handle because the error handling is unique to either a controller or an RPC server. Error hand the reason why it's separate is because in JSON RPC, certain things like a bad ID for a git is something JSON RPC specifically calls out that you have to flag in the JSON RPC part of the payload and not the data part. While in JSON API spec is very HTTP centric, and so that has statuses we must set. But it turns out to be very simple because it's all just tuples, so we just have a case that we have to handle. And this document here is a JSON API document from Alembic. So, so errors that are already formatted as JSON API just go on through. Converting to an umbrella project isn't all sunshine and roses. If you use Docker, it always assumes the root directory for inside the container. So if you need to use one of the so sub OTP apps under an apps foo directory, you need to pass the dash w flag to change that directory inside the container. If you cd into apps foo outside and then run your Docker container, it doesn't care. It doesn't do that sort of syncing between where you are in the host and where you are in the container. Mixed test behaves differently from the root directory, and we still actually have an issue with a race condition where our RPC servers are sometimes connected to the repo too early for it to drop it. And it, when we get to questions, if everyone can tell me what I'm doing wrong, that'd be great. Um, those cons, though, have been far outweighed by the ability to run mixed tests and mixed dialyze on each OTP app, and eventually being able to open source certain pieces, which gets the build time down. When shattering your own project, identify your independent data stores. This isn't just the, back, the backing technology, such as Postgres, in memory or Redis, but data specific to a given domain or user base that may be independent of s sourcing or scaling characteristics. So in our case, the number of users we will have from the agencies is independent of the number of interpreters we have because they're like their employees. You want to hide the backing technology because you may want to change it to optimize for search, caching, or command query response segregation. We're actually contemplating doing command query response seg segregation where the Elixir app would serve reads in addition to the Rails background worker to get load off the server because as some of you may have experienced, the Rails version of your app eats a lot more memory than the Elixir version. And so we got free space to do on the Elixir version. There's so much space on QA actually that um, when Scott did the lightning talk, that Slack bot is in interpreter server. It is not a separate running container. Some conveniences from libraries, such as Phoenix controller render or a use statement that define the majority of a module, can observe obscure commonality in your own app. Dive into your dependencies code. They're right there in depths. You can read it. Maybe you'll have a hard time if it's the Erlang stuff. Um, 
and understand what they're generating and calling on your behalf to see if you can stop repeating yourself and extract an OTP app more tuned to your project's needs by jumping down a layer and calling parts of the library directory, using more function calls and less declarative code. In general, assume that declarative code, such as a use statement, should be there as a convenience for new users that want the library as the final layer of their project. But if you need to build upon a library, look for the functions those macros are calling. And hopefully, the library author has took, taken Chris's advice from his metaprogramming book and immediately called the function after getting into the body of the macro. That might not always be the case. Finally, separate your UI into different OTP apps. This allows you to potentially exclude entire OTP apps from releases that don't target a given UI. And it can also point out pieces that really should be in domains specific OTP apps if you keep having to repeat yourself in code for UI apps, or if you end up having to have a lab notebook when you're in IX because there's no way to quickly insert a new user without like 10 lines of code that you need to just be sitting in Evernote. I hope this guidance can help you, help lead you into the bright and shiny future of Umbrella projects. If you need any help, I'm Chronic Death on Elixir Slack, Elixir Forms, IRC, Twitter. Don't hesitate to ask for help.